Australia's commitment to excellence in water policy began in 1994 with the decision to include water in national competition policy. States were required to have arrangements allowing water trading and a permanent cap was placed on water use at the Murray-Darling Basin. Those reforms played an important role in alleviating the worst effects of the millennium drought. Since then, we've had a national water initiative, Murray-Darling Basin Plan, further drought, controversy over state rights, water rights, environmental flows, establishment and dismantling of commissions, and more reviews. Professor Mike Young believes that after groundbreaking and internationally recognised policy development, we may have lost our way on water policy. Uh, first of all, Professor, is it Professor or do we address you by something else now, sir? I'm officially actually an emeritus professor now, but I'm still just a professor, so, but, but more actively someone who's um, keen about water and, and very keen to get all the detail right if we can find a way to do it. And we're talking about Adelaide water, which is, I, I think, the only water that can corrode a glass. Um, that's all changed, though, I think. It used to be like that. It had a reputation for having awful water. To, these days, it's all properly um, filtered. A lot of it actually comes from the River Murray over the ranges and down into Adelaide. And we have a desal plant we hardly ever use. That's right, but they had to spend the money somehow. So let's just build a desal plant. Well, it was, it was built as insurance and it was built around fear in the middle of the millennium drought when um, the River Murray had stopped flowing and the state was getting very, very worried that um, something might happen. So it decided to build a plant with a 50 gigalitre capacity, but designed to go to 100, and they ended up building 100 because of the um, financial crisis that, that emerged, and they were looking for shovel-ready projects. Mm. So 100 gigalitre plants sitting there, mm -hmm. waiting until we need it. Yeah, roll on the next drought. Um What's gone wrong with our water policy and how do we fix it? Well, I think um, if you look through the areas that have happened, there was a fantastic period, as you described, when we started off um, unusually saying, let's make money out of water. Mm. And that was part of national competition policy. And Paul Keating and the people advising him identified that one of the things Australia had got wrong was essentially a structure for water management that was frozen and wasn't able to cope with change. And what we're still trying to do is to build mechanisms that enable change. And Keating said, for that water which we can use, let's make sure it goes to its highest and best use. And that's what we started the journey to do. And we said we'd live within our limits, set a limit, which was described as a cap, and said there'd be no more water issued to anybody but you'd be able to trade it. And um, there were fines put in place to force the states to open up their markets, or, or their actually water structures to trading. And that's where we started off in really 1996, 1997. Got through to about 2000 and a group of us, including myself, were talking through what was needed. And we essentially decided to throw the entire water licensing system we had in the rubbish bin and build one that was designed to cope with essentially an ever-changing future. And that involved replacing the old water licenses with a share of whatever water was available in the system. And then a system where quantities are allocated continuously. And as they're allocated, they can be banked, um, used or traded to somebody else. And so everybody's ended up with something that looks like your bank account with credits and debits. Uh, when water's allocated to you in the same way as when you're paid, you actually have, have money put into your bank account as a credit. In a water account, you get, get water credited to your account. As you use it, it's debited. Should you want to trade it, the long-term vision is like a BPAY. You can transfer it to anybody else. Taking water in all its aspects from planning to supply to markets, what do you consider to be the most pressing problem in Australia? Probably coping with change and continuous change. And it's not just climate change. Prices go up and down. Rainfall goes up and down massively. Um, everything's changing all the time. And 
the big shift which has happened is a framework that enables us to manage change. The hardest part now is to, as we keep on trying to improve water policy, is to work out what's the role of water and what's the role of other things like taxation, um, regional development. Um, what's happened in much of regional Australia now is people want water policy to really be the prime instrument for actually delivering everything they aspire to. That's making it very hard to move forward. Has there been less interest in water policy and innovation in recent years, despite all of our problems of severe drought and so on? Uh, yes, very, very much so. Because what happened um, through the millennium drought is we came up first with the National Water Initiative, which was a fantastic framework. In fact, you'd still have to give it almost 10 out of 10 if you're a professor saying this is very, very clever water policy. We then brought in a Water Act, um, set up a Murray-Darling Basin Authority, established the National Water Commission, um, and then went through to trying to roll out the Basin Plan. As we went into rolling out the Basin Plan, a lot of politics got involved. The original vision was for a strong, independent Murray-Darling Basin Authority. Politicians got involved and kept on trying to slow up change, avoid dealing with the difficult political issues. And um, as a result of that, we have lost that passion to get the detail right. The lucky bit is we still have one of the best systems in the world. In fact, I'd say it is the best system in the world. It's got no major cracks, lots of little things that need to be done that are all fixable. Does policy reform require leadership at the very top of government and large amounts of Mueller or funding? Um, yes, it needs very strong leadership and particularly commitment to getting things right, which we did have and which we've lost now. We've shifted from a commitment to getting things right to a commitment to trying to make what we have work and to avoid any fundamental changes. Um, the exciting bit that's just happening now is I'm sensing a willingness to relook at things and to take the next bold step forward. You mentioned leadership lacking. Is that uh, all forms of government, local, uh, state and national? Yes, very uh, much so. Um, there are pockets where people are very keen to do it, but there's also not a, a clear dialogue that's occurring. People, have, I think, have got lost in the detail rather than the really big picture reforms that are still needed. And one of them which people are talking about is how to deal with climate change and should we get into a drier regime. Um, and that's one bit at the moment. The framework says we ignore climate change and just assume there'll be variability and that, that we will have a fixed movement around an average a stationary model rather than one which is continuous if you build in continuous adaptive processes you actually wouldn't have what are called sustainable diversion limits instead you just have a sharing regime which was back in the national water initiative the national water initiative said we should have all entitlements defined as shares and have something like a moving average as it gets drier the size of the pools gets smaller as, as it gets wetter, they get bigger. Those sorts of concepts are not being talked about at the moment. Why is the Murray-Darling Basin so important? We hear this, I mean, it's, it's some times of the year, it's almost every, every second day or 10 times a day, then it just sort of disappears. Why is it so important to good water outcomes? I think because it's, it covers so much of Eastern Australia. It starts up in Queensland, covers most of New South Wales, um, almost half of Victoria and half of South Australia. The bit of South Australia which relies on the Murray is huge. It includes the city of Adelaide. Gets a very large proportion of its water resources from the River Murray. Um, so it's, it's, it's the food bowl. It also is a very, very important part of our environment and it has lots of tensions. It captures interstate politics. Um, catches debates between rural and urban Australia um, and 
is very, very much part of our psychic. And it's almost one of the things that defines Australia. What's Australia? Mm. Australia is really beaches and a coastal fringe and a thing called the Murray-Darling Basin. Mm. And then there's an outback. I think Australia is very proud of its outback. Um, the bit in the middle between the outback and, and the coast is the Murray-Darling. What's your thoughts on the, uh, it always comes to life, uh, strangely enough, around elections. What's your thoughts on the, uh, the, the new, the, the, the uh, brand new, uh, the revised uh, Bradfield scheme or just the original one? First of all, the original Bradfield scheme had nothing to do with the Murray-Darling. It was to take water from northern Australia and establish mm. a large irrigation system in in um, western or northwestern Queensland and let the residual from that flow through to Lake Eyre. So it was the idea to take water and run it inland. Um, there are a couple of variants around that are called Bradfield schemes, they actually aren't. They're really proposals to divert water inland that currently flows out um, through to the Great Barrier Reef and to the east coast of Australia. Um, I've yet to see one that adds, adds up um, and I'll be interested to see it. I think this really gets to the heart of what's going on. Why do we use water and why do we want to make so much water in Australia? do things that it does mm. and it's important to realize that australia feeds um three to four times its population it depends how you do it and the mass um but essentially we're using water to grow food for export and it's for making money so we have to think when we do any sort of bradfield scheme is that the wisest use of australia's resources and its money because if we can put it into developing hydrogen, improving our environment, educating our children, that is often a smarter decision because we are a victim of global prices. Mm. We are not growing food to feed Australia. We could halve the amount of water that's used in irrigation and still comfortably feed Australia. What do you think needs to happen to resolve some of the worst problems of the Murray-Darling Basin? The problems now are getting the balance right, getting environmental water right. I think we've spent way too much time talking about the maximum that can be used in a good year, which is what a sustainable diversion limit is. We haven't yet had a proper discussion around a minimum flows. In the United Kingdom, they call these minimum flows hands-off flows, and I love that concept. Imagine going through the basin um, bit by bit and saying what's the minimum flow that always has to be maintained and in the times when that much water is not available what do we do and then how do we build a, a robust sharing system that copes with that mm. once you've had that discussion you then talk about priorities mm. so we have what we call high security water which is really high priority water then there's another slab that's medium priority and then low priority i think the size of the high security pool um, should adapt as we get dry so we send a signal to everybody including cities like adelaide that the system's getting drier so if you want to keep on growing you're going to have to get your water from elsewhere um, those sorts of structures are really important. Um, another one which I think is very important is expanding the Murray-Darling Basin plan and management system to cover all forms of water use. We really conceived the plan for the Murray-Darling focusing on the southern basin and put aside a lot of the detailed issues in the northern basin which are more to do with capture of what are called overland flows. So what happens when it rains in northern parts of the basin is that there are no big dams, so the water used to just flow down in ultimately into the Darling River. Farmers have been capturing that, and as they capture more and more of it, it flows, it, it doesn't reach the river, and we still haven't got the management of that right, still haven't got the rules in there, so we all have to get that properly managed and 
then the third one is, I think, which is really important, is committing to what I like to describe as net water use. Whenever someone takes some water and applies it to a crop or whatever they do, some of it leaks into groundwater and then back into the river system again. And we haven't put enough into measuring what's used in net terms rather than what's used in growth terms. They're all easy fixes conceptually, very hard to put in place. Governments love reviews. Uh, what, do you th what do you think will come out of the uh, current reviews of the National Water in Initiative and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan? Um, I think what will come out is a, as a high level thing. Look, basically the structure is right. Mm. We have, have a foundation which is good enough, or is actually perfectly designed to build something that will endure and which will, will ultimately actually withstand the test of centuries, withstand the test of time. Um, I think there will be, unfortunately, too much focus on detail and not enough on big concepts. I'd be really excited if they picked up on some of the things that I've said are really important, which is building automatic adaptive frameworks um, and focused on that. Um, and also realise that at some stage we need to go back to the system we used to have, which is people had shares and had to manage risk and we didn't have to go on throwing money at this. There's been a massive transfer of money from urban Australia to rural Australia in compensation. When I was first commissioned to look at fixing up the over allocation problem in the River Murray back in about 2000. My brief from the then Murray-Darling Basin Commission was just to make the adjustment without paying a cent in compensation, just to take the water away from irrigators. And we were working through what that would mean for regional development and economies. Um, instead now, there's a culture and a mindset that says everything has to be paid for. The golden rule in management of any system really well is to decide, is to assign risk and assign it to the people who are best able to, to manage it. And that is the farming community, the people who own water shares and entitlements. Do you agree with people who say Australia has enough water to meet all of its needs, but just needs to be better managed? Uh, Yes, we have enough, as I said, to feed mm. ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we have to think about how to manage that water to create the most wealth. But this is really hard because when I started my career and I'm just about to retire, um, there were around about half a million farms in Australia. Now there's something like about 120,000. So in my career, in my lifetime as a a researcher, we've lost over two thirds of our farms, but the farmland is still the same and it's much more productive. And so behind this, there's continuous structural adjustment as it's called occurring, uh, which has kept the remaining population in rural Australia relatively well off, on global standards, very, very well off. But the adjustment process has been awful and very hard. If you're a person who has to leave, a region where all your friends are, then that's very challenging. And water policy is being blamed on that. It's not water policy. It's part of a very important decision that Australia has made is to try and keep its agriculture efficient and keep its um, those people involved in agriculture relatively well off. And on an Australian average, um, there's no clear welfare divide between rural and urban Australia. There's wealth in both sides and a lot of people who are doing very, very well, but there are always people who are having to change what they do. And that's very, very hard to separate from the water policy debate. And my fear out of all of the inquiries now is going to be too much will be said, look, we can't change water policy anymore because of its impacts on rural people. When we first started the journey from our old, very clumsy, frozen system back in the 1990s to putting in place the system which served us really well 
um, as we've gone forward, there was a massive increase in wealth. Unbundling, it was recalled when we put the new water system in place, um, increased the value of water rights in throughout the southern part of the River Murray system, 20% per annum on average for a decade. I think the rate of return from owning water rights through that period never went under 15%. To put that in simple terms, every um, five years, the value of your water rights doubled. So in the first decade, there was a fourfold increase in the value of the water rights that people held. That's mm. massive. Mm. Um, and when you're doing reforms at that scale, people are very supportive. Now we're into the, the fine tuning when each improvement um, doesn't produce another 20% improvement in value. We're talking about getting the balance right, coping with change, um, arguments over should you have rice and should you have cotton rather than the old ideas. They look, we're using this water to make money, so it should go to whatever crop is best. And by the way, um, in any highly variable system, and the Darling system particularly is one of the most variable in the world, um, you need to have crops like cotton and rice because you can switch them off when there's no water available. Mm. If everybody grew grapes, avocados, oranges, um, we'd be in an awful mess because you couldn't give them a guaranteed water supply. Mm. And I can uh, recall grapes, avocados, oranges, because actually I grew up on the land and I, I swore I would never pick another grape, avocado or orange when I left, which is around Mildura. So um, it brings back those it's warm... In Australia, by the way, I love Mildura. I spent a lot of time there. It bring... But it brings back those warm, fuzzy memories of picking. And let me tell you, as a young bloke, that wanted to play cricket for the, you know, for the world side, uh, picking avocados, oranges and grapes really interfered with my batting practice. <laughs> yes, well, but it probably also kept you strong enough to be a good sports person. But, you know, behind that classic example, mm. um, it, when you were doing, probably every single grape was picked by hand. More a and dreadful more job. Now, but are, are picked mechanically. Mm. I can remember being up in the cotton industry up around Moree and seeing new cotton picking machines coming in that re each replaced nine people. Wow. Um, and that's a shot to a community mm. when one machine mm. means that there are nine less jobs in the district. Nine less jobs means behind that nine families and children and all the rest of it. Um, but that's the thing the basin has been lucky to be part of, that we have still relative prosperity. We certainly don't have widespread poverty like you do in much of the rest of the, 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 the rural world. Mm -hmm. But that's come about because we've embraced technology continuously sought new systems and some of the other new systems that are coming which are very interesting are around satellite based actually monitoring of water use in the us now there are irrigation systems that don't have meters because they can measure better using mm. satellites mm. i really miss those days the uh, the spiders the snakes the um the 128 degree fahrenheit temperatures humidity and rain and now you've got machines. I mean, they don't know what they're missing out on. Look, uh, but it was always good at the end of the day when you had a beer and you sat back with your friends and said, gee, wasn't, wasn't that great? And you talked about cricket and footy or whatever it was. Um, that was fun. I can remember it too. Mm. And I loved every one of those days. The good old days. Now, speaking of the good old days, uh, nowadays environment seems to be on the tips of um, every second person or every activist. Do you think environmental activists are too influential in either local, state or federal government today? No, not at all. Um, I think um, lobbyists from all sides and people who engage in activism, um, pro, pro farming, pro the environment, pro lots of other things all have a role to play. The difficult part for people like me is to be seen to be independent and fair and innovative and to keep your distance and not to end up being tarnished as an environmentalist or as a pro farmer, um, pro in markets, um, getting the balance right. We need mm. to move from 
simple debates to highly sophisticated discussions that get the structures right. You know, if you look at a mobile phone, it's behind that there's a very, very complicated set of things that all function incredibly well. I would like a water management system which is as sophisticated and has got as much potential as that, and that requires people who are able to lead. And but they need behind it the environmentalists mm. and the rural communities, the um, farming communities, all lobbying in their different ways and arguing and trying to influence the debate. But that's a debate about values and about choices. Um, behind that, there are people who have to make sure the system works really well and often cheap shots are taken where, where people scream at environmentalists and go for the person rather than to talk about the concept and say, wouldn't you have it? Mm. What do you think is the best way forward then to guard against severe drought and water shortages? I mean, do we, again, I mean, it's, it was suggested that the Bradfield scheme, uh, dams is another suggestion. What do you think? Um, I'd be surprised if, any, if many more dams add up. Remember, all the water is already flowing, so somewhere. And we've still got dredges in the mouth of the River Murray because we haven't got enough flow going through. So what does a dam do? It captures water that was already going to be captured somebody else. So it's going to change a flow regime. Might change a little bit of evaporation. Um, but once again, it's really fine-tuning. And yes, it might facilitate some management of different systems. But very few of them will pass a hard economic test um, so I'd be surprised if that happens um, and if it adds up. Mm. So I don't see much case for dams. Um, that's really as far as I could take it. Mm. Uh, changing some dams um, would be interesting. In America, they're talking about taking dams out um, and perhaps as part of a reconfiguration plan, that makes sense. Mm. Um, there's a lot of water water storages which probably should be decommissioned um i think we're capturing way too much in overland flows and whether or not you um, in private dams require as done in some parts of the world to have a pipe that flows out through the dam wall so it always leaks so there's always a base flow or not is an interesting debate or whether in fact you even take some of those private dams out so i would mix a discussion with dam building with a discussion around dam removal and ideally some sort of optimization system. Dams are always a great conversation piece at a, um, at a barbecue or something and then especially with a few drinks under, under the belt I mean it always adds a bit of excitement doesn't it? It does and it, there's a lot of emotion but it's uh, when you go through it and you realize that the other thing a dam does is it changes the flow regime Mm. And every time you change the flow regime, then there's a different role for environmental water managers. Mm. And it, what's happened in Australia, which is another, I think, really exciting innovation, which has really stood out. And that was a decision to give the environment water rights or water entitlements, as I prefer to call them, mm -hmm. um, so that they're active in the water market and, and the environmental water managers now are able to buy and sell water and um, are on a e much more equal standing with our um, actually irrigators and other water users. Mm. And that's started a discussion about getting more environment per drop, so-called environmental water efficiency um, under lots of different banners, but essentially it's trying to get more environmental benefits per mm. drop of environmental water and also getting um, more actually crop efficiency. So you get more crop per drop, more environment per drop. Mixing that together, I think, is one of the big innovations Australia has done. But as I said right at the start of this interview, we haven't spent enough time talking about um, hands-off flow or base flows mm. and if you live in South Australia and you want to take water for irrigation or for a city like Adelaide there has to be enough water in the river to carry it through so you can get the water out so base flow mm. is often 
thought of as water left for the environment, but is actually um, water that's needed by everybody so you can take water out. And that's a separate thing. And I mm. think we'd make a mistake if we continue to call that environmental water. So one of the other big things that we need to do is change the language. So we stop calling all this water just environmental water and have different types of water, base flows, um, minimum flows, um, environmental water shares, and a much more sophisticated discussion. Mm. And then the other bit that probably needs to be thought about, Mike, is the important role of governance and engagement with communities. Um, there's a lot of discussion about getting communities involved, getting Indigenous First Nations people involved much more than they have been, and working out how to do that in a system which can change rapidly is difficult. The state of the art is to have um, a governance structure of normally between six, seven people who are able to make fast, rapid, final decisions. And they have to learn to do that in a way which, which is seen to engage with everybody, hear everybody. Mm. And we have a reserve bank in Australia, which is able to change the interest rate tomorrow if the need be and they're empowered to do it. But at the same time, they have to listen to our politicians, listen to the economy. And I stress that, listen to the economy. So a Murray-Darling Basin Authority has to listen to the river and listen to the community and be able to make very rapid decisions sometimes. And that's probably the other weakness that we still haven't got right, mm. is mechanism that forces the states who actually run the system to get the detail right and to keep on complying. And a lot of the problems today um, lie with the reluctance of states to keep up with the plan and implement it, and particularly to put the necessary reforms in place to get markets right, to get to get actually market information mm. right, get um, trading systems um, very, very affordable and much cheaper. It's really interesting, we're talking about water and how it's used to uh, probably basically increase uh, profits for uh, export with our food. Uh, in California, where I, my, my, my first radio station was in the Central Valley of California, and I saw a map the other day. And, Which city? Uh, uh, it's Santa Maria, actually, Santa Maria. Well, I know it, yes, know it well. Yes, well, actually, it was Lompoc, or Lompoc, really, but I, no one, no, that's this little... In fact, when I was there, it was the uh, flower capital of the U.S. But um, I always say Santa Maria because it sounds bigger. But the it's the the satellite maps are really interesting. Uh, over the last ten years, basically gone from or maybe fifteen years, really green and lush, and now you can see the transition to just just yellow. They're just running out of water, and uh, we don't want to get into that situation either, do we? No, uh, in fact, I've spent a lot of time working in California and Nevada, and I'm about to start actually working in Oregon, trying to put in place an Australian style mm. water allocation or, or water sharing system mm. is that um, essentially starts off by saying, look, you've got to set a limit, and then you've got to work out how to share and adjust as supplies change. And the really important thing to do is look, severe long or long periods of low flow and low water available will come and will be there. We talk, I think, wrongly about increasing drought frequency. I always like the Australian B B B Bureau of actually Meteorology's definition of a drought, which is based around the simple idea that um, you take an average and, and the bottom decile, the 10% of driest years, you can call a drought. But if the system's getting drier, then you still have the same frequency of droughts. It's just, just the whole system has got drier and we need to develop language that doesn't see um, a drier regime as a drought. It's mm. got to be seen as a drier regime. And um, learning to adapt to that and working out which bits of the system you stop irrigating forever um, are the ones you shut off mm. and being able to shut off bits 
and also increase bits and then change what you grow. We've made big changes in Australia. Um, there are two that I've really noticed. A lot of rice growers are now growing cotton because um, cotton breeders were able to to um, develop a cotton that would grow in southern New South Wales and even through into northern Victoria. And sometimes cotton's been more profitable from rice. So mm. they have swapped from growing rice to growing cotton. Mm. But that's awful if you own a cotton, uh, actually a rice mill, if you own a cotton gin, that's great because mm. you make a lot of money. Um, but dealing with all of those sorts of changes continuously is where we have to go. And the way I look at the um, Californian systems, the Nevadan systems, um, is the moment they're frozen, they have very poor functioning markets, no, no allocation systems that allow temporary trading, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, of actually regional inequities, but also a lot of wealth. Mm. Uh, um, and I'm hoping that they will be able to develop some of the technologies and ideas that will come back to Australia as we go forward. And heading to Oregon, you're not far from that wonderful state of Washington, which has some of the great wines of the world. So I'm sure as a, a, a learned person, you'll enjoy to uh, enjoy a few glasses of red to really kick in the, uh, the brain cells and, uh, or destroy them, whichever way. How many drinks you have? Uh, so um, it, but actually, there's, a, there's a slight snag at the moment. All the work I'm, I'm actually involved in in Oregon is all by Zoom because I can't travel. Oh, there. you can't, can you? So you'll have to have a virtual drink. No, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work, work, does it? Australian wine from the River Murray. <laughs> talking about. Well, but you got, some, you got some lovely areas there. You've got the Barossa Valley. I mean, it's, the, the wine is actually much more palatable than the water, well, of, of my yes. memories anyway. But, but these systems, that the big problems there are in groundwater management, mm. not so much surface water management. Mm. And it's one of the other things that it, Australia still hasn't got right um, is the connection between ground and surface water systems. And in lots of the, the Murray-Darling, the reaches of the surface river systems, which are called losing parts of the basin because they lose water from the surface water system into the groundwater system mm -hmm. and then further down there are places where where actually the river gains water um, we put in a lot of our um, dry our salinity and um, actually interception schemes to stop uh, um, saline water flowing into the lower parts of the river murray mm. Mm. A lot of those systems are really no longer necessary because we've developed our groundwater and we're managing it all so much better. But learning to manage that interface is something that we haven't even started to really mm. talk about at the mm. moment. And uh, it should be adapted once again. Another discussion. Um, uh, when this goes to air, you'll be at the cricket uh, and I'm sure you will be seeing a couple of pink balls at that stage. So <laughs> enjoy yourself very much. I'll definitely do that and looking forward to it. And I hope Australia wins. Uh, no running across the ground with a glass of red in the hand and not much else either, by the way. We don't allow that anymore, especially in Adelaide. I know, you have to behave yourself very carefully and there's going to be probably still um, considerable separation. Um, Australia is lucky. We seem to be managing COVID very, very well. We have. We're um, a very lucky country. country. Uh, We're uh, very lucky. And we have so much more more to learn and, and so much more to grow and... I think the uh, the future, providing we keep our heads on our shoulders and don't get too radical, I think, or too 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 lazy, I think our, our future is still looking pretty darn good, isn't it? I think so. And we've got to commit to excellence. If yep. we um, commit to doing everything as best we can and always looking for the new, better ideas, mm. we will remain a prosperous, wealthy, happy, content and environmentally sustainable nation. Mm. What more can you ask? Can't ask for much more except maybe a victory in the cricket and a good red. Mike Young, Professor Mike Young, thank you very much. Pleasure.